and we begin. Awesome. Welcome, guys. So we are continuing on chapter three of Bhagavad Gita. And I believe we left off on verse 25. We left off on verse 25. So uh, if you want to open up your text, uh, we'll just start reading from there. And we'll just see what we can do today. Uh, we're approaching the more than halfway done with uh, chapter three. So maybe we'll finish it uh, next week. Okay, so we'll go from verse 25. As the ignorant perform their duties with attachment to results, the learned may similarly act, but without attachment, for the sake of leading people on the right path. So as not to disrupt the minds of ignorant And a person should not induce them to stop work. Rather, by working in the spirit of devotion, he should engage them in all sorts of activities. So this is, again, just speaking of this karma yoga and one of the interesting, seemingly uh, contradictions, seeming contradictions of karma yoga, which is that of renunciation and action combined together. And if you think about it as, uh, you know, action as the thesis, synthesis then karma yoga would be the synthesis right of those two extremes and so part of what he's krishna is saying here is that um the learned can also do their duty it's not just worldly people who show up every day and are responsible but that the learned should also do that but without the worldly attachment spoke about this last week when we said just as any great man does something or a great woman does something so the common people follow right so even when krishna comes even when lord ram comes they still follow these dharmas they still follow the dharma that's appropriate for them okay and then this next verse is kind of interesting right it's like you don't want to disturb ignorant people is basically what it's saying by by trying to rip them out from a from the place that they're at and try to artificially put them into a high level of spiritual life. Because he's saying basically just you shouldn't try to rip them out. Oh, look at this. You just have your nine to five job. What Maya? How much illusion? Ah, yes, you are. You are certainly in the matrix, right? You're just sheeple. You are just sheeple. And, you know, you should... Uh, you should be like me, which most people that say this kind of stuff are like hippie bums, you know, that just don't have it or something like you should be like me. So enlightened, but in all seriousness, it is a very good point that we shouldn't, Krishna is here slightly addressing like we shouldn't induce them to stop their work because naturally through their work, they can become purified through the the rings of that yoga ladder, like karma kanda, just doing karma kanda. Which, of course, karma kanda is like someone who is worldly, but they're pious, like they do the right things. So, if someone's like really ignorant, it's it actually Krishna. He says that, or, or Srila Prabhupada says that the devotees, of the Lord, are more merciful than Krishna because they're willing to disturb the common people. So it's like the Hare Krishna is jumping up and down in the streets with the mismatched socks. They're willing to disturb people. They're willing to disturb the common people. Why? Because they have they have a sense of compassion that they're not doing it for their own sake. Uh, and so, unfortunately, that's most of our condition. When when Krishna was speaking this, the atmosphere was one that there was at least a baseline of dharma and a baseline of what one should know as true and not true and what is right and what's not right and what's good and what's, and what, what I should be doing with my time and not be doing. There was like a baseline of that. And so that's kind of what he's speaking to here. Even if they're attached to just kind of being like a good person who does their duty, you shouldn't, you shouldn't disturb that kind of person and be like, oh, you're in my, you're not, you know, but one one who sees someone suffering they feel they feel compelled to bring that person 
disturb. They're willing to disturb somebody for that. Um, think of an example later. Um, okay, so next verse is verse 27. This this is a very, very famous verse. So if you want to learn one in Sanskrit, you can learn this here. Prakriti kriyamana ni gunai karmani saraha ahankara vimudatma kartaham itimanyate. Okay, this means the spirit soul bewildered by the influence of the false ego thinks himself the doer of activities that actuality carried out by the three modes of nature. Okay, so we think that we're the doer, basically. Why? Because we have the ignorance. We're covered in it, and it's not very cute, but it makes us think that we are the ones doing and in control of things. And of course, the more one has ignorance, then the more that they desire to control. Because in order to enjoy, you have to have control. In order to control, you must have power. That's why over others and over the environment. Um, but really, here it's going deeper. What some of the acharyas are saying that the jiva, right, the jivatma, the soul, has has a body made of knowledge, right? Your actual spiritual body is made of knowledge. It's not chitananda. But it's covered, it's covered by this physical form, covered by these impressions of wanting to enjoy this material world. And that's just kind of like a beginningless impression that we've had. Just like newer impressions, newer habits that you pick up start to influence you in a particular way. Now imagine an influence that's been acting on you, from not just this lifetime, but from millions of lifetimes. So that is that in desire there has always been there as long as you've had a material body and a material mind. So people try to um, fix this whole problem of exploitation by having different isms. But the thing is, like environmentalism, feminism, whatever it is, they solve racism. And those things are all good, but no one can become free from the exploitation. No one can actually become free of that, that exploitative mentality, right? Because you will see yourself as the enjoyer. You will be the central point from which all your reality is based. And every your main goal will be to satisfy your mind and senses. And that, is, that necessitates you exploiting the environment. You seeing what's in it for me. How can I enjoy do I get? It's just a very natural thing of the false ego. So we like to think we're so selfless and whatever, but the truth is not that cute. So um, also another thing that they're saying here is that the doership of the Atma is only made possible. So we have like, we, we, we're a little Purusha, right? But our ability to flex our control is very limited. We have a very limited scope of what we can actually flex control over. And even that we get so puffed up about. Look at what I've done. Look at how much, look at how much I've done. But it's like so small. How much can you do? That's why it's nice to be like in nature, right? Like in the big mountains or like, like under this. You feel what's called happy small. I, that's one of my favorite feelings is like the happy small. But what they're saying here deeper in this verse is that the doership of our individual self is only made possible by so many other factors. First of all, body. You must have a body to act. You must have senses. You must have the five life, factors, the pranas. And then also you must have the paramatma, who is the God sitting in your heart, who is the activator of all of those elements. Okay, so what this verse is basically saying is when we think that we are the only doer, it's that we have some doership, but when we think that we are the only doer, that is due to ignorance. That is due to false ego. False ego. 
And so how to conquer this influence is going to be discussed as we go. And that's part of this beautiful journey. Using that particular false ego you have in this life as a method and as a stepstone to transcendence. Because one must have a false ego. One must have an, an identity, a character to put out in this world. Or else you could not do anything. You have to have like some avatar, right? And so what's beautiful about the rest of this chapter is that it shows you how can I use this kind of my real avatar and to use it as an alchemical transcendent process that doesn't just bind me deeper into the matrix, deeper into the illusion, but actually I can use it as a process of liberation. So it's a really beautiful section. It's a really, really deep and just barely scratching the surface of it with my understanding. Um, okay, verse 28. Does this make sense so far? Like understanding like, okay, I'm not the doer. And to the extent that we are disturbed when things do not go our way, it's just how much we are covered in that ignorance. It's so sad, right? I'm like, damn, I'm not that spiritual yet, right? Uh, yeah, it's kind of upsetting, but you know what? We're trying our best here. So verse eight, one who is in knowledge of the absolute truth, O mighty arm, does not engage himself in the senses and sense devotion and work for fruit of results. So yeah, who's in knowledge of the absolute truth? knows that the senses and the mind are products of the gunas of nature. They're just material modes. And those material modes want to interact with other material modes, other sattva, rajas, and tamas in the environment. And so one who's in knowledge just sees the gunas. The modes of nature are trying to interact with the modes of nature. And I don't become enraptured in necess necessitating myself to engage with them. Okay. Uh, let's see. Yeah. So anyways, a lot of this is kind of hitting the main point from different angles, but like this is the knowledge that's required for detachment. So you, you can actually do your karma yoga from a place of neutral observation, right? Just like when I was sharing about like you becoming enraptured in your favorite TV show and you feel their losses as your losses. You know, how could Susie, you know, how could, how could Kim K do that? You know, or like whatever it is. And you feel it to be, you feel some investment makes theater and movies and all these different things so compelling is because you begin to identify your story with their story and it takes you on a journey and you can escape your own story which is really why most of us do it we don't like our story so we choose some other story for a little bit uh but just as we know that you know you can press pause and the avatar I have in this life is just like that Netflix show. It's just a particular movie that's playing out and that I've been placed into, but it is not the first expression of my totality and of my being. And I can witness it as a more neutral observer, not becoming so emotionally enraptured in it. Does that make sense? So the thing is, it can kind of seem like neutral blob of consciousness with no real feeling but actually this person becomes the most sensitive person in the world because they're seeing from a spiritual vision and they're rejoicing in the soul and then they're also seeing other people just being enraptured with the goods of nature and then having them be bound more and more by the ropes guna means rope so these ropes are just tying people and they're just seeing friends. There are other people, the people of this world, just getting 
more and more. They're addicted to bondage. And they feel, they feel some sadness about that. So it's not that they become this neutral blob. It's that they activate their potentiality and fullest compassion and fullest ability to be controlled by the external material forces. Okay. So verse 29 says, bewildered by the modes of nature, the gunas, the ignorant engage themselves in material activities and become attached. Ah, but the should not unsettle them, although these duties are inferior due to the performer's lack of knowledge. Saying, you know, there are people who like different types of ropes to bind them with. A gold rope, silver rope, you got your bronze rope, you have your, you have your rajas, sattva, and tas. And people pick which ropes they like to bind themselves with, but all are bewildered, but all are bound. And so those who are very heavily bound, right? You are not this body. You are not this mind, right? Someone so, you know, been ignorant. You are, you are not this body, my friend. You are not, my, not the mind. They're, they're too deep. They're too deep. You are the bliss of the consciousness, my friend. <laughs> you, are, you know, and just start to, the head bobble. Uh, you start to say something smart. Um, but what it's saying is that rather by following their particular taste for action and also by elevating them through some some. through succession of the Vedic ladder of Karmakanda and all these other things, gradually will arouse their interests in uncovering the Atma. My personal take on this is, is the secret weapon of mine is called Prasad, feeding people food that has been offered to God, because not only is it vegetarian, it's sattvic, it's beyond sattvic, it is transcendent food that has been transcendentalized by mantra, by grace, by, by God accepting the love in which it's offered. God eats the love and that, that food becomes transcendentalized. And I really like, without preaching like anything to my friends in college, I would bring the prasad that we cooked in our temple. And out for lunch, and all my friends were eating meat and you know, just doing whatever. And I just, you know, they're like, mm, that looks, you know, good. Can I try some? Okay. And then I just started doing more, like one and a half servings. And like, okay, you can have some two servings. And I'd start to serve it out to some friends. And literally, I think I got maybe four or five friends without me saying a just by feeding them throughout one, two, three years being with them in, in class. And they just were like, wow, this is so good. And I joke with this guy that's like at this little Indian market, it's Samosa house and we get our different veggies there. And he's like an Pakistani guy who is Muslim. So there's always like this friction between the Muslim and Hindu thing and Muslim kind of like all into meat. And, you know, I was raised in a Muslim family, so I know these things too. And this guy was, is it all about, it's like he wants to pick a fight with me about me not eating meat. And I'm just like, I don't even care to talk to you. Like, I don't care. Like, it's not impressive to me to talk about eating, not eating meat. Like a pigeon doesn't eat meat. It's not that impressive, right? I don't feel very high about, but he always picks this fight, of, fight with me. And I say, my friend, you come to our house, we're cooking 50 different items. I bet by the end of that feast, we'll forget all about me. I said, just come, just come. You know, we don't have to battle all these philosophies, meat, no meat. I said, just come, you'll taste this and you'll forget all about what you knew before. So anyways, it's my little jostling. Like this is why I brought this up is because it's, one of my gurus, he says, love is communicated through food and flowers. 
right? Love is communicated through food and flowers, which is why God's always having a festival. Christians always have always cooking, always offering flowers because love is communicated through food and flowers. And so everyone speaks that language of food. So I find that it's the most effective language is by cooking prasad. That's just like so only good and feeding its people. So that's my secret weapon. It's like, don't disturb the ignorant, but it's like, you can feed anybody and they taste that language of love and it will elevate the consciousness, right? Because what we eat, we become, right? Literally. Oh, we become okay so let's see uh verse 30 therefore O arjuna serving all your works unto me with full knowledge of me without desires for profit with no claims to proprietor and free from lethargy fight <laughs> back up a second because there's these beautiful quotes i forgot about from the bhagavat purana disturbing people and judging people and it's been a topic had on my mind these past few weeks months is the power of criticism envy and jealousy and how nasty it is and how i participated in it on a subtle level all the time you know just the subtle the subtle judgment the subtle criticism the subtle not being happy for someone's ass or being happy when it seems like something kind of doesn't go their way. It's all signs of pollution of the heart. Um, but there's these two quotes I wanted to read. It says, one should neither praise nor criticize the condition, nature, and activities of other persons. Rather, one should see this world as simply the combination of material nature So I thought that was nice. Like one should not praise or criticize anybody because it's simply just a combination of material nature and people who want to enjoy. Okay? Everyone feels justified in their enjoyment. No matter what someone does wrong, everyone feels justified and there's a desire for enjoyment that brought them to do such things. So everyone feels compelled. And it is that same ignorance that we have. And while we may not be doing the, you know, Hitler level stuff, we have that same ignorance that coats us, that impels one to do such things. And so we're not so immune. So othering people is such a hypocritical to do because we are steeped in that ignorance. We are steeped in that same ignorance. And while different flavor to it it is that same ignorance that impels people to do far worse things so we're not immune because we're still in it right and so and then also sometimes um, this is another topic but There's people in all different levels of spiritual advancement within a spiritual community, right? Why? Well, because Krishna, in one sense, means all attractive. And who does all include? Well, it includes everyone. So what levels of people are going to be included? Well, level. So it is like going to a hospital and saying, why are all this was for healing? Right, or it's like going and criticizing a homeless man for being dirty while he's in the shower. Right, I'm in the shower. I'm here, so it, a, a spiritual path is for the admittance of one's own material addiction and rehabilitation. I am an addict to my own false ego and to my own ignorance, and I need help. Right, we all say hi, Yamuna. Say yes, <laughs> me too. Right, I am also addicted to my false ego and my senses and my mind are always controlling me and making me prideful and jealous and envious and arrogant. Hi, Yamuna. But how can you criticize me if I'm in the shower? So 
So how can we criticize, especially those attempting to be spiritualist for their ignorance while they're showering? So I just find that it's, while, while transgression shouldn't go on, like without reconciliation, like transgression shouldn't just go unchecked, I find that is not in judging and criticizing somebody. Because if I just look at myself a little closer, I see I have that same ignorance that they have. Right? But generally how we operate is we want mercy for ourselves and justice when it comes to other people. Is it not true, right? You want mercy for yourself. Oh, well, you know, it's because I had a hard day and, you know, this and that is flared up. They're like, oh, sweetheart. I, and you start to like play that whole thing. And then, oh, they're feeling bad for you. You just did something bad to them. And they're like, oh, sweetheart, I didn't know. It. You know, it's, it's, it's the mercy factor. But then when someone else does like, yes, they should be seen for how bad they are. They should be punished to the highest extent possible. They should know how bad they are, right? So it just shows how ignorant we are. It's so stupid. So anyways, I, there's these kind of social gossip, criticism, things. I, I really, hearing gossip is just as bad as speaking it. So we should be careful of that. So that's, that's what this is saying. It's the last quote here. It says, whoever indulges raising or criticizing the qualities and behaviors of others will quickly become deviated from his own best interest by his entanglement and illusory dualities. So it's another verse from the Bhagavad Gita. Oh, Govinda. So um, verse three, let's take a deep breath. And exhale. You guys with me still? Doing okay? Okay, cool. So verse 30 says, Therefore, O Rajun, surrendering all your works, profit with no claims to proprietorship and free from lethargy, fight. Okay. So Krishna is also giving a little hint here that one of the key distinctions between a materialist and a spiritualist is where they where they invest their dedication and also that real love and transcendence does not mean renunciation it means dedication it means giving all of oneself so that's what our krishna is saying here surrendering everything to me which doesn't mean a white flag, like an English surrenders kind of like I give up and I suck and I'm powerless kind of thing. It's like a white flag, we surrender. But surrendering means like surrender, like to give, to render oneself to the other, to give oneself. Surrendering all your works to me, right? With full knowledge of me, without desires for profit, means there's not a person motive with no claims to proprietorship and free from lethargy fight right so this consciousness is giving up that controller mode giving up that need that desire to to insert or to express one's own control over nature but rather we say, by, by the arraignment of God, I'm getting this result, I'm getting that result. Just like different flavors or rasas become medicinal at different times of year, different rasas in our life, sometimes tick, sometimes the bitter bitter sometimes we need that and then sometimes we need the sweetness but all flavors are medicinal one just wants sweets all the time 
then one gets diseased. One gets diseased. And then they, get, they can get even what's called jaundice, by which even sweet things taste bitter. When one eats too many sweets, then sweet things taste bitter. Nobody knows. Right? You cannot avoid the dualities meant for you. You can, only, you can only prolong them and exacerbate them. To repeat them. And we don't want to repeat them. We want to grow. Okay. What else here? Okay. So this next verses are really beautiful. It's, it's again, that idea of al the alchemical process of understanding and unlocking using one's own dharma as a sublimation tool for karma yoga. Okay. So this verses 31 to 34 that are that are discussing that. So I'll read these. <clears throat> Verse two, those persons who execute their duties according to my injunctions and who follow this teaching faithfully without envy become free from bondage of fruit of activities. But those who out of envy be considered bereft of all knowledge, be fooled and ruined in their endeavors for perfection. I'll read the next one too. Even a man of knowledge acts according to his own nature, for everyone follows the nature he has acquired from the three modes. What can repression accomplish? So is it's giving the beautiful ideal. So this first verse, those persons who execute their duties acute. I can't even speak tonight. <laughs> According to my injunctions, and who follow this teaching faithfully without envy, become free from bondage. Okay. So what's nice here is that it says even those who can't follow but have faith and who do not disrespect the teachings, who do not become envious of a higher standard, they gradually come to a higher platform of consciousness. In like, oh man, these Vedas are giving a very high ideal of how it should be. If one becomes envious and critical of that high standard because one sees where they're at and they see the Vedas are calling them to be, then it can cause this bitterness towards the ideal. Saying here that as long as one does not develop that bitterness towards the ideal and just even failing at the ideal, as long as you're striving towards the ideal, you make advancement with good faith and with a good attitude gets you closer it's actually not a failure it's actually moving you closer to where you want to go um so it says even though at the present they cannot follow by faith in the teachings and lack for envy their obstacle crease so that's very nice i i think all of us have experienced certain obstacles as we've tried to be better spiritualists and try to give our we see okay even though i'm not perfect i'm trying and then now certain obstacles of my ego are decreasing and so much is healing and so much is healing because as i let go of the false ego which is the root source of all my miseries i see obstacles start to decrease so it's beautiful then it says, but for those out of eight, disregard these teachings, do not follow them, are considered bereft of all knowledge, but fooled. I want to start using that word just like randomly. Be fooled and ruin their endeavors for perfection. So it's kind of like, oh, I don't know. That kind of sounds like me. Sounds like for me, I, I feel like I'm disregarding the teachings I'm hearing. And I'm disregarding and I'm not following them regularly. So I kind of seem be fooled and it's not very encouraging for me, this verse. So then Krishna is like, all right, no, <laughs> don't get discouraged. I got you. Verse 33, fam. Even a man of knowledge according to his own nature, for everyone follows the nature he has acquired from the three modes. What can repress? 
according to the gunas anyway, right? So better to own your foolishness without without criticism for the ideal, because naturally that foolishness will vanish. <laughs> I'm sorry. I don't want to be too. I don't want to be too shady. I will say this without shade, that I was just brown. Graham, and there was this yoga training and ad that I got. And so I clicked and I saw the profile and there was a teacher saying, you know, I've traveled to Machu Picchu and I've traveled here and I've traveled there. And what I've realized about enlightenment is that enlightenment is here right now. And enlightenment is not for another time. It is here in your Oh boy, like... <laughs> It's like, where, where? It, like, if you look at any of these problems, it's not just a matter of redirecting. Like, that is just called awareness. That is just being present. Where, at least it's called sattva, where there's the, the, the vasistudes, the vasanas, the different impressions on the mind begin to subside a little bit. And one becomes a little steady in sattva, and they can just experience a semblance of truth, sattva. But enlightenment is not such a cheap thing that I can just say, oh, it's in my heart now and I can have it now and I just have to, no. You know, just doing whatever. What happens after right here and now? That is the, the horrible moments. That is the test how enlightened you are. What happens when your greatest addiction is in front of you? Your greatest aversion in front of you? Then where is your enlightenment here right now? So I just think it's important that we we understand the depth of, of trying to take us and that they're not cheap things. And that I, I feel extremely far from the goal. Extremely far from the goal. Um, but we, when we cheapen a thing, we rob ourselves of a genuine experience. That's, that's why better to just be honest, man. You are not enlightened. Better to be, I'm a fool. Thick Maya. I got, I got thick Maya. And I have this, this cup on me. And I'm going to try the hero's journey. I'm going to try the call to adventure. It's the long route. It's the hard route. It's going to be filled with different demons I have to fight and confront. One can't just say, I am there now. No, one must trek and traverse. It's and go to the next level. And then one grows from experiencing the vicissitudes of existence. One grows and one deepens. Okay, <clears throat> so anyways, apologies. I don't mean to be that. I feel like I was, but I just, I, I, I think that we all as leaders a yoga and spiritual community have to set a certain standard on how we're presenting ourselves as enlightened or not enlightened and not robbing people of a genuine experience by trying to market something as easy and as here right now. Right? Krishna's someone who's achieved the goal is very rare. To find someone who's even genuinely striving towards the goal and not just running away from suffering. By their religion is not based on their spirituality is not based on just simply running away from duality. And such a person that's not that is very rare. Most people engaged in spiritual life are find something that'll give them a little bit of hope. But to find someone who is actually seeking truth is very rare. And then out of that small selection, to find one who has found truth is very rare. 
And then out of that selection to find one who is always living within that truth is even rare. It is the most rare. So we have to be honest where we're at. We may know what the ideal is, but we won't get closer by faking it. Krishna says, what does repression accomplish? What does faking it accomplish? Also, trying to be artificially renounced more than one is does not get you there either. Okay, so he's going to give the synthesis of all of this in a moment. Right here, verse uh, 34 and 35. So it says, there are principles to regulate the senses and their objects. One should not come under the control of such attachment in the verse because they are stumbling blocks on the path of self-realization. Yes. So this is now one of the one of the sciences of how to deal with desire. Uh, and it's the science of regulation. It's the, the middle path. Not too much, not too little. One, I always joke about this, right? Bhaktivinoda Thakur saying, one needs, one without enough sense gratification, one will die. And so I quote him often and say, yes, I'm just doing my duty. I'm trying not to die. So I'm just enjoying a little bit my life. I'm enjoying. But also too much enjoyment takes one from the path too. So this regulation is a really personal science that one has to develop because there's no gold standard on regulation you know we're attached in a verse to. And so for you, attachment may look like, for you, regulating might look like only smoking seven times a day. And then that genuine stage that you're at, and then smoking four times a day. And as you know, Srila when he first initiated some of his disciples, they, do, they knew nothing about Vedic or Vedic culture. There's not like yoga studios everywhere and like, you know, online yoga teacher paintings. There's nothing. It was, you know, 1965, 1966. And he had one of his very fresh new disciples, Murti of Jagannath, this form, sacred form of Jagannath. And Jagannath means Lord of the universe. It's, it's, it's quite a deep topic and we have Jagannath here in our house and Jagannath is the Lord of Marma therapy. Also he's a transcendental doctor and so many other things. So where I get my Ayurveda practice from is this mystic tradition of Jagannath, but he was telling him to carve this wooden form of Jagannath. And so he came to visit him in his apartment. He said, Oh, Swamiji, you're here. And he had the pack of cigarettes sitting on top of Jagannath's head as he was carving Jagannath. And so he's like, what is this? He said, have I not, you know, taught you? But he's thinking, you know, they're like children. They need to be taught spiritual science. And so he didn't say, oh, you're nonsense. You know, you should go away. You're Maya, you should go away. He said, smoke one less cigarette a day until you finish the pack and never smoke again. And he did. Through the power of his guru's instruction, he's like, okay, smoke one less a day, and he finished it. So it's this, it's this idea of understanding one's natural attachments and aversions that keep one bound to the sensual platform of existence, where I am just living for the gratification of my senses. We all do. But one has to be honest with where is this level of my attachment? And how can I just regulate that down a little? And then rise my spiritual practice to a genuine extent to where that is okay. And then I challenge myself again to bring it down a little. And this is when one becomes integrated. This is when, when one becomes integrated. Is when you are no longer controlled and pulled in all directions by the five senses, your ears pulling, your eye pulling, your mouth pulling you, no longer pulled. You can just sit, right? Early on the Gita when Krishna Arjuna asked, what does this yogi look like? How does he sit? Well, he certainly doesn't have senses pulling him everywhere. 
Why? Because he's done the science of, of regulation. Okay. Um, so this is a beautiful verse. You know, there's principles to regulate these attachment and aversion. And one should come in under the control of such attachment and aversion because they're stumbling blocks on the path of realization. So sometimes even the best things for us, we are averse to. But the thing is, the modern philosophy that's out there is follow your heart, follow your truth, chase chase your dreams, live your, you know, live whatever it is, right? It's, and there's obviously a truth in that, but how people take that is whatever I feel to be good because it's pleasurable to me is good in actuality. And so they conflate something feeling good and being pleasurable with something being true and good and honest and uplifting and good and beneficial. When we conflate those things, we doom ourselves because we are attracted to putrid things. If you can't have more and more of it and get more and more benefit out of it, it is a putrid thing, right? You take any of your pleasures, right? Like when I was in high school, college, like Led Zeppelin, take my favorite Led Zeppelin song. I play it. I'm like, man, that's blue light. You know, I'm like smoking weed. I'm like, man, that's Led Zeppelin sign. It's so good. And then I play it again. I'm like, all right, yeah, you know, all right, on repeat. And then you play it again. You're like, uh, you know, okay. Like, it's nice, but we can move on. You play it again. If you force me to listen to that again and again for days, I will hate that song. If you force someone, you know, they, they like to have sex, which is a natural human impulse, but do it again and again and again, again and again and again and again and again. You get diminishing returns and it actually becomes putrid. You can't, it, it becomes unstomachable. So that's the difference between material and spiritual pleasure is spiritual pleasure only increases with usage where a material pleasure diminishes in its gains. And so this is why that whole philosophy of just chase your truth, you know, live your bliss, all that kind of stuff is very dangerous because what is natural attachment towards? It's towards things that are putrid and things that is like already been chewed gum, right? I chewed it already, I'm gonna chew it again. Chew it in a little different setting. I'm going to chew it over here. I'm going to chew it in Europe. I'm going to chew it in Ibiza. I'm going to chew it. We try, to, we try to like change the setting so it tastes all different. But when I was like, I, I've been very blessed to travel to at least maybe 30, 40 countries. And I realized at one point, I was like, oh my God, everywhere is the same. People are eating, they're sleeping, they're mating, and they're defending. What are people doing? They're just eating, they're sleeping, they're trying to reproduce, they're defending what's theirs. My ego, my stuff, my this. I was like, oh my God, everyone's doing the same thing everywhere. Why am I traveling? I'm like looking for something new, something new, fresh, pleasurable, but all the variety I realize the same. And that pleasure is not in the thing, it's in the consciousness. So even I'm trying all the things, I'm feeling diminishing returns. Why? Because it's not in the thing. It's in my consciousness. So that's why this whole thing is dangerous because if you want bliss, awesome. that, is a, that is your birthright. That is the nature of the soul. If you want bliss to the highest extent, spiritual life can give that. Because what? Bliss comes from consciousness. If you become a connoisseur of understanding consciousness, you can experience bliss way more than just beating yourself with the same stimuli over and over again and stimulating your tongue and, and your ears and stimulating your nose, stimulating your eyes. Okay. So don't get me wrong. I'm still addicted to all my sense gratification and aversions and all that stuff. but 
we have to um, just inventory. Take inventory and ask ourselves, like, is this helping me become the man or woman I desire to be? Right? If God was here, if my guru was here, would I be proud of the man I am in front of them? Right? God doesn't only see what happens in church. He sees what happens at home, he sees what happens behind the closed doors, he sees what happens in the mind. I'm like, oof, sorry, God. I'm like, change your channel, go to somebody else. <laughs> um, okay, last, last of verses here. It is far better to discharge one's prescribed duties, and though faultily, than another duties, another's duties perfectly. Okay. That's a good one. Is a very famous one. It's better to do your own duty perfectly than to try to do someone else's duty, even if you can do it perfectly. Destruction in the course of performing one's own duty is better than engaging in another's duties. Perf to follow another's path is dangerous. And we see that. It's the law of nature. When you're in harmony with nature, with the environment, you experience health. When in harmony with your own nature, you experience contentment. But experiencing both, then there's some lack of harmony. Right? You're not doing a duty that's a duty of yours. You're doing something influenced by society, influenced by some other force, influenced by pressure. How many people actually do their do their college degree as their profession? It's very low. But there's it, what that does is it shows us that one is that one is impelled to something against one's own nature because of expectation. But the thing is, you're the captain of your ship. No one else is in control of your life, and so one has to again take that honest look at who who do I want to be? Who's the woman I want to be? Who's the man I want to be? What does she do? How does she walk through the world? How does she talk? How does she deal with duality? How does she help? How does she bring her light into the world? How does, you know, all these things. But I find for myself, sometimes I avoid these questions because they're uncomfortable. Because it requires a, uh, an empty, quiet room. And my mind doesn't like that. My mind is, again, addicted to putrid things and, and stimulus. So to find that quiet place where I can enter, the, enter that inner chamber of the heart and sit with myself and be real, it it takes a courage, actually more than any outward. It takes courage to sit, sit with oneself. Viktor Frankl, he said, he's a Holocaust survivor from Auschwitz. He said, the root problem, the root of all men's problem comes from his inability to sit in a room with himself. And I thought about that, even my addiction to my phone and checking my updates. It's like, it's like actually neurotic. Like if any cave person saw me, they'd be like, this person's diseased. This person's like effed up. Like we got to call, we got to call a witch. We got to like, we got to ban, banish this fool. <laughs> Ain't having that in our village. Neurotic, like checking the... This guy's possessed. We gotta do a, gotta do a, a, what's it called, exorcism on him. Yeah. So we actually are being possessed. We are possessed, but we like being possessed, so we're okay with it. We're possessed by the the ghost ghostly mind and ghostly senses. 
right, that hijack our actual soul's experience and our swadharma, our swabhav, our actual internal identity, internal way of moving through the world. So Arjuna asked some questions moving forward and it ends the chapter with that. So I'll read it, but I'll read it again next week. I'll leave it as a thought. Arjuna says, O oh Krishna, by what is one impelled to sinful acts, even unwillingly, as if engaged by force? This is a very famous part too. By what is one impelled? And in this context, again, we have to not think of sin as a Judeo-Christian term, but as that which is against one's own interest. That's really what sinful means here is that which against one's own soul, not like an arbitrary set of laws made by a dude with a white beard and he's going to smite you if you don't do them. It's what is against your actual soul? And why am I, why am I impelled to do things against my own good? As if I force, I feel forced in one sense, to do things that are against my own good. Why? Why is that, Krishna? So this is a, a beautiful question, and we'll get a beautiful answer next week. So we'll end here. If there's any questions, comments, reflections, feedback, corrections, anything. Or you can just say one thing you liked from today that stood out. What you were just talking about reminds me of this quote I read years ago, and it said, you know, decide what kind of life you really want and then say no to everything that isn't that. And it just, when I read it, it just hit me so hard. And I wrote it on a post-it note in like 15 places. It was in my office. It was in my car. It was in my kitchen. It was in my bathroom. It was everywhere that I could see it all the time. And just this reminder. And I've always used it as a reminder. Yeah, sometimes it's hard and confronting. And sometimes we're avoiding it and not doing it. But it is just this really nice reminder to like stay to that true north of where you're trying to go and what you're trying to achieve. And it's okay if we waver as long as we maintain that north. I'll write it down. Yeah. Lisa. She said, what is that quote? Maybe you can put it in the... <clears throat> yeah, I find... I find sometime as an, sometimes as a semi-intellectual person because I don't... I know intellectual people and I'm not actually equating myself with them. Uh, as a semi-intellectual person, I like to find newer philosophy and newer concepts and these kind of things that you hear that to, to maybe my old self <clears throat> could seem like cliche are actually profound. And something I've been realizing is that it's not about the fancy ornamentation of ideas it's it's more about like what's much more valuable is a simple truth lived deeply than many complex truths live shallow shallowly and one of my friends he was sharing like <clears throat> it's if you go deep to one truth you can you can mine all others others arise so I've been thinking about that more, just like instead of reading more and more books, like I had this thing where I was just like, I'm going to read a lot of books. And I did. I would read at least three hours a day for years. And I read like, I don't know, 40,000 plus pages of different books. And it was great. I, you know, I read through so many beautiful Vedic texts, but now I'm like, if I haven't changed my life, what have I learned? I'm not learning if I don't change. I'm just entertaining myself and wasting my time. So why am I wasting my time? Why am I wasting my time tickling my brain thinking I'm more learned now because I've collected more shallow 
or complex ideas lived slowly. So Marlena, just like, yeah, sometimes, you know what, it's real simple things. They just like hit us in a deep way. And we're like, wow, it just sticks with us. Something so simple. And we have to keep those things like gems, I find, and not reveal them to too many people because it's your inner realization. And when you show your, it says, you know, do not, do not uh, throw your gems to the swine or whatever, right? Like do not, do not show your best diamond to just everybody. So I, I find that we, it's, it's valuable in sanghas like this and intimate things like this where we can sometimes share the heart and those deeper intimate realizations. And it's like, yeah, you know, this is who I want to be. Or it can be appreciated and, and received. I thank you for trusting us with your gem. Appreciate that. Okay, Divya, I saw you unmute. You always have you gems. <laughs> um, no, thank you, Yamuna. So much of what you shared was really powerful. Um, and I think when you said like you are the captain of your ship, um, it hit really deeply because I'm realizing on the one hand, there are times when I'm like, oh, you know, like in order for me to do my dharma, I, like I have to have the right environment, I have to have the right apartment, I have to have the right friends, and I just have to have the right job and the right partner. And then I'll be able to like really shine and do my dharma. And recently someone was like, your dharma is your responsibility. Like it doesn't matter if everything else is going your way or not, it's still your responsibility. Um, and so I think hearing you tonight really reinforced when I, I needed reinforcement. Um, and then I'm also wondering, like, if we're captains of our ship and also our decision making is impacted by our senses and confined by, like, the state of our intellect as it is today, how do we, I'm just realizing, like, wow, it takes so much spiritual work to know that you're steering, you're steering your ship in the way it needs to go. Yeah, it's <laughs> that's the question, right? It takes it takes to work, right? To know that we have to get to a certain level of spiritual maturity to trust to trust ourselves mm. to guide our own ship because ultimately guru doesn't want to hold your hand like a baby forever. Mm. Right? The more advanced disciple knows the heart of the guru and knows what the guru wants before the guru even says. Mm. So, but before we get there, there's the checks and balance system, which we call Guru Sadhu Shastra. You know, mm -hmm. our, our gurus, the sadhus are the saintly people we look up to. And then the Shastra, what, is, what are these Dharma texts saying? What is yeah. the Bhagavad Purana saying? And when you do that, you obviously are going to create more contrast in your life because you are using the highest skills possible as your checks and balance system. Mm -hmm. which is going to ask a lot more of you. So most people avoid holy people, right? Like they avoid holy people because it's confronting, you know, even, even genuine ones, you know, obviously people avoid non-genuine holy people for a reason, but even genuine ones, people, oh, oh. because yeah. then, then as soon as one hears truth, one is obliged to live it. And it's unfortunate. That's why stop reading so many books. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's so powerful. And um, one last thing, I, I like when I hear so much, like follow your intuition. That's something I've been thinking about a lot. And I'm like, oh my God, like how do I even understand what my intuition is versus like what my mind is and all that stuff. But yeah, I guess, yeah, you're helping me think so much, so deeply about um, what it takes to actually be able to hear something as as sacred as your intuition and and in our world today where it's almost oh if you just like close your eyes and look within you can hear it which maybe some people can I I'm probably not there yet yeah um, I think it's a beautiful question I don't all of us are innately connected with God and God is in our heart so I think while even within my own spiritual community, people definitely err on the side of caution to 
share any genuine spiritual experience they may have had for, for, you know, the danger of looking like they're a cheater or they're a charlatan or they're posing as more advanced than they are. We all have had a genuine communion to some extent with God, which is why we're here, whether that be under the stars or whether that be with a piece of music or whether that just be sitting with oneself. There's different levels. And, you know, just as you tune your, the frequency is always there, but it, you need the, you need the radio. And not only do you need the radio, but you need the radio tuned to the perfect channel to get that frequency coming through clear. But even those little moments of communion we've had are a genuine transmission. They're just not full tuned in to the exact, you know, decimal point of the station that God is trying to give us. But even just the fuzzy sound of God's transmission is, is communion and it's beautiful and it can bring us to tears <laughs> just being with it, just sitting with it. And so I think allow yourself to have your genuine dates with destiny. Allow yourself to have genuine dates with destiny. And also just, I, I don't think it takes too much to sincerely look within oneself and check one's own motives. Uh, yeah, I'm motivated by my big fat ego right now. Like that is where I'm coming from. And then there's moments where I'm inspired and somehow grace is like acting upon me. And I'm like acting more selflessly than I usually am capable of. And I'm inspired and like making these amazing decisions. Like that is a rare moment. And you want to create a, a lifestyle that, that creates an environment favorable for moments like that to occur. And for us to be swept by the current of grace, one has to submit themselves to the banks of the river of grace. One has to live near the, the banks of the river of grace in order to be swept away by it sometimes. And then we're going to get washed back up on the show. Oh, well, you know, it's grace. It's not by your own control. That's the whole thing. Not just like kayaking down it forever by your control. Cool if you are. Congratulations. You don't need to be in my Gita class. Should be teaching, should be teaching the class. But yeah, I think that's I think that's key is creating environments that are favorable to our our own swept away in the current of grace. And then just checking ourselves, like, man, I'm motivated by jealousy and pride and envy and greed and egotism like all the time. And if you don't think you are, you're probably not looking hard enough. And at the same time, you just know your conditioned soul in the material world, and it's not a thing to beat yourself up about. But because we don't believe in, um, what is it called in like Christianity or Catholicism where like someone reprimands themselves? Uh, I can't remember the name, but we don't believe in that. We don't believe in that thing. We believe in transformation. We don't believe in we don't believe in beating oneself with a stick. We don't believe in shaming oneself over and over again. What real reconciliation is, is be better. I don't know. Like, don't just beat yourself with a stick and how horrible you are. Like, just be better. Like, do better. Be more sincere. Like, pray, cry, cry to God that you're like a failure sometimes. It feels good to cry and like be a fool. Sometimes it feels good to bow down. It feels good to say, I don't know what I'm talking about. It feels good. So if we are okay with going there, we will have more moments of communion because guess what? When your cup goes lower, then your cup can be filled. When you put your cup a little lower with humility, you allow it to be filled. But if you try to be at the equal level all the time and the controller, you know, here's God's cup and here's yours and you're trying to be at the same, you know, buddy, buddy, you can't actually have your life be filled with grace because you're trying to be in control. So the, the key is, Krishna, I surrender. I don't know. I'm a fool. 
I'm an idiot sometimes. Like, I need help. I'm addicted to my senses. I'm addicted to my ego. It feels good for me to just even say that to you guys. Like, you know, I like to be the teacher and the one in the hot seat. You know, I'm a fool, you guys. I'm a fool, Krishna. Help me. I think that's how we invite in. At least that's my experience. Whatever little experience I have. I want to uh, share something. Um, I, I love the whole idea of, uh, you know, surrendering to Krishna and giving it all to Krishna. It has actually been my intention is to, um, yes, yeah, surrender to Krishna. And uh, recently I had lost my journal and I gained a bit of a tat an attachment to my journal. It's a all my, you know, my progression from the beginning of the month, you know, my journey. And um, I'm always like, you know, setting my intentions um, in my journal, but I came across the 15, 12 verse where it was talking about Krishna was saying, I am the moon, I am the sun. Um, so um, that when I said that, that made me more um, happy that I lost my journal. I wasn't so overwhelmed, like, oh, my, all my work, like, you know, my progress and all this stuff. So now mm -hmm. in a smooth journey of just giving it to Krishna and, you know, I can just, you know, my, my crown chakra isn't too overwhelmed. Like you said, maybe stop reading too many books. Um, so I'm glad I lost my journal and I have- What did you learn in Yamuna's class? Stop reading books. I'm glad <laughs> you got that one. I'm glad that you got that one down. Yeah. I, I, yeah, I appreciate your saying and like, what it reminds me of is one of my gurus, he, he says that we should get in the practice of preemptively giving. That surrender is the practice of preemptive giving because ultimately everything is taken away in life. So one should give before destiny. So it reminded me when you were saying that I lost my journal and I said, you thought, oh yes, this is, this is Krishna. I thought of the story that that friend tells about um, this like man who's walking, you know, through this holy town and he just has like this bag of popcorn and he's like walking through this holy town with this popcorn, you know, going somewhere. And all of a sudden a gust of wind comes and his bag of popcorn blows in the wind. And he says, Oh, Bhagavan. And he, he like, he like offers it to the, to Krishna, like as it's flying, but like he was going to go enjoy it himself because it's already too late. He thought, oh, why don't I get benefit from just Bhagavan, oh, this is for you. Like it's his popcorn's blowing away. So sometimes we're like foolish that in life, but better to offer the popcorn before and preemptively offer. So because you can get credit for that, right? You don't get credit for something like that where you're like, Can I offer you my journal. It's like, no, you lost your journal. And because you're foolish, I'm not saying you, I'm just making the joke. Like, you lost your stuff, you're foolish, now you're trying to offer it, spiritual and stuff, doesn't work like that, I'm sorry, you know, so this guy at the popcorn, I always remember that story, but the idea is preemptive giving, Krishna, whatever your will is, I'm happy, because I trust that, that you have my best interest in mind, and you're my best friend, and you're conspiring for my success at all times, that's what I remind myself. You're conspiring, making better plans for my success than I ever could. At times, I don't like your plans, but I step back into trust and it allows me to have this communion moment born of suffering. And that is really chapter one of Gita is Arjuna Visha, the yoga is Arjuna's yoga of dejection, that he actually has a communion experience because he's dejected. That And that the dejection is not God forsaking you, it's God inviting you closer, right? The horrible moments is not God forsaking you. Why has God forsaken me? It's an atheistic mentality that, you know, it's just some prosperity gospel and God is supposed to always rain down awesome stuff on you all the time and you never grow and learn anything because you're just getting rained on awesome stuff every moment. No, God strips. If God loves you, he'll give you what you want. It, or no, if God, if God likes you, he'll give you what you want. If God loves you, he'll take everything away. I 
just says that himself. I didn't, I didn't make that one. Trademark. Krishna said that. If I, if I favor you, I give you what you want. If I love you really deeply, I take away everything. Why? Because Krishna gives himself. Krishna gives himself. And he's the Purushartha Murti, meaning the, the Murti, the personified form of any goal you could imagine is amplified millions of times within Krishna's very body and existence. And just be, why are we all searching for in every single endeavor? Love. Who is the personification to the extent of love? Krishna. Who actually can attract Cupid himself? Krishna. Right? It's one of the names for Krishna, Madan Mohan. He is the one who attracts the God of love. The God of love cannot help but be attracted to Krishna. And then Sri Radha is called Madan Mohan Mohini, which means the one who attracts the one who's, let me get this right. Krishna attracts Cupid. Radha attracts Krishna. Radha is superior. The divine feminine Shakti is Devi, is she, God is controlled by our love. Who can control the supreme controller? You can. How do, we, how do we purchase that love? How do we purchase that control? The price of a song. That's what mantra meditation is. That's what kirtan is. Can God be bought? He who owns everything? Yes. Why? Because he wants to. Why? Because that's the only way love can flow. You're the control of everything. You, there's no love. If you allow yourself to be bought, you can be loved. How do we purchase him? Through, this, through song, through some flowers, through food. So simple. A two-year-old can do it. I don't even remember what that was. In, oh, the journal thing. Just somehow... Somehow I've got here. Okay, any last thing? Okay, Shrey, I, I, I see you here. So, yeah, like recently I had a very good experience. Like I attended one of the Kirtan, um, I don't call it a gathering. Um, it was done in the church. I saw so many people chanting on like different, different Hindu shlokas. But there was a phase actually where the Maha Mantra, where, what you call like Hare Krishna, Hare Ram, correct? Like that was something like I just closed my eyes and that 20 minutes I was lost. Like that 20 minutes, I don't know what kind of phase I was in. Like I could feel that when people call it Krishna conscious, that was something like I could connect, I could feel. And like, I think so that was one of the experience. Like I just wanted to share as we all are here and we're going through this too. So it was just enormous and like, after that, before that, you just step back and you just think that what was I that 20 minutes and what am I right now? Like, I think so. It really makes you think uh, and it may, really makes you reflect on your life at one at one phase. So, but yeah, like, thank you so much for guiding me and being through this journey as well and really making go, go basically close to Krishna. So thank you so much for that. It was just enormous. Like I had tears in my eyes and I'm like, what is happening? I was right in front of the, the Keith and Walla who was doing. It was just, I don't know, that experience. I cannot even, I think so. My words are just not enough. One point of time, I feel like. It's very simple. It's not even a mantra because a mantra requires OM and all these other things to be a mantra. It's just names. It's just, have you ever sung a song that was just names? It, it was just repetition. Like, I, it, it was just like four. Just yeah, names. it was just those words. Like, it was repetition. Like, it was chanting. When people call, oh, what is chanting? Like, I could feel like, you know, that repetition yeah. is something which has power in it. So the whole thing is a, is a deeper science of swaying back and forth, the call and yeah. the response. And 
being led and then following it's a dance and the mantra and how the mantra start and and trying to oh trying to drown oneself in the ocean of the name of god and what are what are the embankments of that ocean? union and separation one one experience love and union and it's sweet right like when krishna is with radha it's so sweet it's so sweet but when krishna is separated from radha it's even sweeter because radha says krishna when you're in front of me i just see you here but when you're away from me i see you everywhere right that is total absorption in the beloved and that is even how the mantra is structured hare krishna Hare Krishna, right? Together. And then Krishna, Krishna, Hare Hare, apart. Union and separation within the mantra. The call and the response within the mantra. The, the, the two increments of union and separation, creating that ocean of prem, of love. And when we just get a little drop of that water in our mouth, it's, it's so nourishing and hydrating. It's what the soul is looking for. The soul's parched in a desert. And it just gets so is, that, up. is that the reason like I now you had a good point like the joining and the separation within the mantra is that the reason like when you chant or when you do the chanting you just want to go back to the same word back and forth like you know you, you just wait hypnosis. for the first word it's like hypnosis that yeah. is the highest state of ecstasy is being so enmeshed so absorbed that you lose yourself. You lose yourself in an experience and just everything for Krishna, everything for the beloved, everything for my beloved. So it is a science. It is a science. But I'm now speaking way more above my pay grade than I should be. So um, thank you guys for a beautiful class. Thanks for going 30 minutes over. Uh, it was really, really nourishing for me personally. And um, I just appreciate the opportunity truly because I feel like it's purifying for me. It's, I get to purify my heart by submitting myself in front of wonderful souls like you. So I really appreciate it. Okay. Thank you guys very much. And I hope to see you next Thursday. We'll finish chapter three.